Let me tell you a story of a picturesque fishing village in Palestine whose peaceful existence was disrupted by a murderous force that entered the village, forced the men and women out of their homes, then separated the women and children from their menfolk, husbands, fathers, sons and brothers, who were then lined up against walls or tied to trees and brutally murdered, dumping their bodies in mass graves. The crime didn't stop there, but some of the women and girls were then taken by these militias and gang raped. Any remaining survivors were then forced from their village, made into refugees, while this murderous force took over their picturesque village and claimed it as their own. This is not a made-up story or fake atrocity propaganda. Rather, this occurred in a town in Palestine that then later became part of Israel. It's a story of a village of Tantora where up to 300 unarmed Palestinians were massacred and later put in mass graves. And this isn't the only village that this occurred to, but at least 28 such massacres occurred in the creation of the Zionist entity known as the Israeli state in 1948. Benny Morris counted 28 massacres of which Tantura is only one. So it's not an isolated episode. For instance, on April 9th, 1948, as a prelude to the creation of the Zionist entity, Jewish paramilitary groups massacred Palestinians in a Palestinian village near Jerusalem called Deir Yassin. They massacred Palestinian men, women and children using mortars, grenades and gunfire with reports of rape and mutilation of bodies. 25 survivors were then taken, paraded around Jerusalem as trophies, after which they were then executed. The massacres that took place, particularly at Deir Yassin, was a clear message being sent to the Palestinians that even though Deir Yassin had a non-aggression pact with the Zionists, that no Palestinian was safe and that their men would be killed and their women would face the potential of rape. It had a profound effect on Palestinian civilians who feared that these Zionist paramilitary groups would also target their villages. Today there is no Deir Yassin and the Israeli government still keeps the documents of what happened classified. The Zionist paramilitaries destroyed some 500 Palestinian villages, resulting in over 750,000 Palestinians forced from their homes and made into refugees. 14th of May 1948 may be celebrated by the Zionists as Israel's Independence Day, but 15th of May 1948 is known as Al Nakba by the Palestinians, the catastrophe, and it's a day we shouldn't forget. So, what led to Al Nakba, this catastrophe, with the growing anti Jewish sentiments in Europe and with laws like the Aliens Act in Britain, which ironically Arthur Balfour initially proposed as a bill? You know Arthur Balfour from the infamous Balfour Declaration but we'll get to that later. But this alien act was there in order to prevent Jewish migration from Eastern Europe where they were being kicked out to Britain. So with the increasing anti-Semitism across Europe, Theodore Herzl began calling for an independent Jewish state. Britain in particular also saw the advantage of supporting this Jewish state as a solution to two main problems. Firstly, as a way to remove Jews from Britain, like I mentioned about the Aliens Act, where they didn't want Jews to emigrate into Britain. Secondly, they saw this as an opportunity to implant a pro-British entity into the heart of the Arab and Muslim world. As Ronald Storr, the British governor of Jerusalem in 1939 stated when he was talking about the British policy of Jewish mass migration to Palestine and the support of Zionism, he stated that the purpose was forming for England a little loyal Jewish Ulster in a sea of potentially hostile Arabism. So Ulster, of course, is a province in the north most associated with colonial settlement of Ireland and the divide and rule tactic between 
Catholic and Protestant. So they very consciously exported the model that they had imposed on Ireland to Palestine with terrible consequences. You see Ronald's stories talking about how they tried to change the demographics of Ireland, where they brought in Protestant Christians who are loyal to the British crown into Ireland in order to create a loyal population that would support Britain over the Catholic, anti-British, anti-crown population. You see, Britain saw Palestine as a strategic objective, as Lord Curzon stated in 1920, for a distinct military and strategic objective. India. If you look at the map of the region, Britain had a number of key objectives. Firstly, they wanted to control the two major sea and waterways, that is the Red Sea and the Arabian Gulf. This would help protect its shipping routes, particularly of the exports from British India, allowing ships to pass unimpeded through the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean. Secondly, after the newly discovered oil fields in Iraq, they wanted to use Jordan, then known as Transjordan, and Palestinian ports, like in what's currently known as Haifa, to transport this oil to the West and Britain in particular. Thirdly, Britain wanted a loyal population that could act against any aggression by the Arabs to maintain its dominance dominance over the sea and land routes for its own economic interests. So what we saw is an alignment between Zionist interests in the desire for their own ethno-racial homeland and that of the main colonial power at the time, which was Britain. But unlike the claim that Palestine was a land without a people and the Jews were a people without a land, the Arabs came and conquered it and immediately lost it to others and did nothing with it. The right. others did nothing with it. There was, there was no someone else. There practically were no tenants. Right. There. That's my argument. In fact, Palestine had already an established population of mainly Muslims, with also Christian and Jewish communities. So expulsion of the original inhabitants was a Zionist logical imperative. This was clearly seen by Herzl as early as June 12, 1895. At the time, he was still formulating his ideas about Zionism and confided in his diary, stating, we shall try to spirit the penniless population across the border by procuring employment for it in the transit countries while denying it any employment in our own country. Both the process of expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. In 1905, Israel Zangwill, an organiser of Zionism in Britain and one of Zionist top propagandists who had coined the slogan, a land without a people for a people without a land, acknowledged in a speech in Manchester that Palestine was not a land without a people. In fact, it was filled with Arabs. He stated, we must be prepared to either drive out by the sword the Arab tribes in possession as our forefathers did or to grapple with the problem of a large alien population, mostly Mohammedan and accustomed for centuries to despise us. So it was clear that Zionists knew that Palestine was definitely inhabited, that the only way to establish the ethno-racial supremacy state was to expel or remove the Palestinian population. And this was being facilitated by the British that only sped up after the infamous Balfour Declaration in 1917, after the British colonized Palestine through the help of the Arab revolt led by Sharif Hussein and his sons, who later were gifted leadership of the Arab states Britain had created. Churchill joined the Peel Commission, which looked at the division of Palestine, rejected the Arab wish to stop Jewish migration to Palestine. This is what he said. I do not admit that the dog in the manger has the final right to the manger though they may have lain there for a very long time. I do not admit that right. I do not admit, for instance, that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that wrong has been done to those people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, or at any rate, a more worldly wise race, to put it that way, has come in and taken their place. I do not admit it. I do not think the Red Indians had any right to say American continent belongs to us and we are not going to have any of these European settlers come in. They had not the right, nor had they the power. Can you imagine calling or likening the Palestinians as dogs in a manger? Really shows you the dehumanizing and colonialist mindset of Britain at that time. After the Palestinian revolt against the British and their Zionist agenda in 1937, the British had a policy of de-arming the Palestinians, while at the same time allowing Zionist Jews who recently migrated to Palestine to arm themselves and form militias. This obviously created an imbalance of power, with a growing population of Zionists having weapons and had fought with the British in both World War I and World War II. This resulted in the creation of Jewish paramilitary groups like the Haganah, who originally formed 
formed in the 1920s, and then later more radical militias like Ergon or Lehigh. Haganah militants received clandestine military support from Poland and also sought cooperation from the British. So what we had was a deliberate arming of militants who desired to take Palestine as their own ethno-racial state, knowing that they would have to forcefully remove Palestinians in order to create their Zionist state. And of course, the Palestinians, who were the largest ethnic group in the land, had lived there, i.e. Palestine, for centuries, if not millennia, going back to the Canaanites. After World War II, the growing frustration of the Zionists with Britain in not handing Palestine to their control resulted in them beginning to undertake terrorist attacks against the British. In one such infamous incident known as the Sergeant Affair, Ergun militias kidnapped two British sergeants, killed them, strung up their bodies on trees. Their bodies were booby-trapped. When a British officer began cutting down the bodies, he was then injured in the subsequent explosion. Britain, wary of the problems in Palestine, decided to end their mandate, which resulted in Zionists declaring their independence on the 14th of May, 1948. Those militias that undertook terrorist actions against both the Palestinians and the British later formed the core of the Israeli army, euphemistically called the Israeli Defense Force. What were the response of the Muslim leaders? As we've mentioned in previous videos, the Arab states were formed in large part by the British and the French. Not only did the European colonies define the borders of these states, but they also installed leaders like King Abdullah over Transjordan or King Faisal over Iraq as a reward for their revolt against the Uthmani Khilafah. Similarly, the French created the modern day states of Syria and Lebanon in their secret agreement with the British, the I, the Sykes-Picot Agreement. In fact, many of these rulers had accepted the creation of the Israeli state and held meetings, secret meetings with the Zionists. These rulers were more interested in their own national self-interest and holding on to power through the help of their colonial overseers than to be truly concerned about the Palestinian people. Fawaz Gurgis, a professor of international relations, mentioned this about the Egyptian and Jordanian kings that they appeared to be more concerned about their respective strategic positions than that of Israel. However, due to the huge uproar in the Arab streets and the fear this may destabilize these newly created artificial Arab states, Arab rulers led a disorganized attack against the newly formed Israeli state in 1948. Even though it was disorganized, the initial attack by the Arabs was successful and resulted in surrounding the Israeli forces. Inexplicably, however, at that moment where they could have defeated the Zionists, the Arab leaders agreed a ceasefire. This helped the Zionists to rearm and reorganize and then led a counterattack by the Israeli forces, resulting in the Arab leaders withdrawing from the battle. The victory of the Zionists not only helped cement their newly created state, but also allowed them to take more lands from the Palestinians. Remember that the UN had initially recommended that Jews would take 54% of Palestine which of course is a complete joke. However, after the war, they actually took 78% of Palestine for themselves, declaring sovereignty over this land. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians were thus ethnically cleansed from their homes and made into refugees, a situation that hasn't ended as we see with the massacres taking place in Gaza. You see, the Nakba never really ended, but it's been a continual policy by Israel. They have sought to take ever more land from the Palestinians as we see in the settlements in the West Bank. They've attempted to create laws and an environment that makes life difficult for Palestinians in both Gaza and the West Bank, attempting to push them out of the land, while at the same time allowing any Jew anywhere in the world to come and settle in Palestine. And just like the British initially saw the strategic benefit for their colonial ambitions in the region, we now see America taking on their mantle, protecting Israel and providing them with billions of dollars worth of weapons so they have a strategic asset within the region. Yet as the world is now seeing Israel for what it is, an ethno-racial supremacist state founded upon terrorism and ethnic cleansing and continues to enact genocidal policies against the Palestinians then the question is growing whether Israel is now seen as a liability for the West, a state that's gone rogue, as well as the fact that the ethno-racial state just seems completely unworkable in the Arab region, particularly when Israel has a small population of 9 million, 2 million of whom are Arabs, yet wants to expand its control and territory 
into the Arab and Muslim lands. Most people, and particularly the hundreds of millions of Muslims that surround Israel, are well aware that this tiny state of Israel seeks to control the region for its and the West's benefit, attempting to dominate the regional economy, firing missiles when it pleases against countries they don't like without impunity and simply acting with no regard for Muslim and human life. Is it really viable in the long term? If examples like apartheid South Africa and white minority rule that took place in some countries in Africa teaches us anything, it teaches us that Israel's days are numbered, particularly when a new Islamic leadership now seems to be on the horizon, one that will reflect the sentiments of Muslims and implement Islam in a holistic sense. We can only pray that the oppression is reversed, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants justice to the people of Palestine and thus gives stability to the region, whether they're Muslim, Jew or Christian, a stability that Palestine had once under the Islamic rule and under the shade of Khilafah.